All right, good morning again. Um, kids, do we have any kids that are going downstairs? If, if we do, can you raise your hand? Zayden, good, yeah. Chuck, yes. Uh, Denna and Ryan, Shelly are back in the back if you want to join them. Not all at once. Um. All right, this is our, um, it's going to be a lot of fun downstairs, so probably more fun than up here with me. Um, this is where we go into our prayer time, and we have much to be grateful for. Um, we have many needs, so let's go to the Lord in prayer. Um, Father, thank you, Lord our freedom. Thank you for your word. Thank you for your son, Lord, our salvation. Thank you for your sending your Holy Spirit to guide us and direct us, Lord. And we do lift up those in our community that are sick. COVID's going around again, it seems, and people out, Lord. May your just your presence and your hand be on their situations, God. May you strengthen and refresh their spirits, Lord turn their eyes towards you. Even now as we pray, may they just feel your touch. Pray for Audrey and Randy and Randy Johnson, Lord, Kim Spangler, everyone that's just going through it right now, Lord. We just pray for your mighty touch on them. And might you guide us today, Lord. Speak to us through your word and your spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you, Tyler. Um, it is um, Fourth of July weekend. This is my first Fourth of July weekend here at the lake. Um, it's not as busy as I was expecting. Um, I heard horror stories about the traffic. I thought we were going to be in New York City. Um, <laughs> turns out five cars at a traffic light is traffic here. So um, th does anyone have like family traditions? I know people are here from out of town visiting. And do we have cookouts? Anyone have cookouts on Fourth of July? Hamburgers, hot dogs. Is there a staple condiment that you go to on your hot dogs? Who said ketchup? Come on. Uh, ketchup, huh? Um, Daryl Euler says he puts ketchup on everything. He puts ketchup on grilled cheese sandwiches. Um, but it, it is the 4th of July weekend, Independence Day. And isn't America a great place to live? Even in 2022, it is a great place to live. It's not a perfect place to live, but it is a great place to live. And it's a lot better than most other nations we could call home. America is a crazy place, though, right? It feels really crazy in 2022. Here's what somebody wrote, only in America. Only in America can Amazon get to your house faster than an ambulance. Um, <laughs> Only in America does CVS make you make the sick walk all the way to the back to get their prescriptions while the healthy can buy suntan lotion up front. Um, and this one really hit home, sadly. Only in America do people order double cheeseburgers, large fries, and Diet Coke. Oh, I am that guy. Um, only in America do we leave cars worth thousands of dollars in the driveway and fill our garage with junk. Uh, America is not perfect. People say our school system is falling apart. And actually, I read that 85% of Americans can't do basic math. I'm just glad I'm in part of the other 25%. Um, so are you, apparently, if you got the joke. So, uh, But I still believe America is the greatest nation in the world. I feel blessed by God to have been born and raised in the United States of America. And I feel like sometimes I swell with pride or I get prideful and talk or act like I've earned something. But the truth is it was God's sovereign choice for us to be born in this great country. We need to be grateful for that. And that's worth celebrating this weekend. A father was talking with his rather rebellious son one day and said, every person who lives in the United States is a privileged person. The boy answered, I disagree. And the father replied, that's the privilege. We have the privilege to disagree. 
We have the privilege to speak our mind. We have the freedom of religion, of speech, of the press, and of the right of petition. We have the freedom to hope and dream and pursue our dreams. We are free in so many ways. And we have these rights because our four, of what our forefathers have done. You and I didn't earn these privileges we enjoy as citizens of this land. But I'm thankful for those who did earn them and pass them on to me. And that is what I celebrate on the 4th of July. And I think about these men and women who came before us and made it possible for us to enjoy the freedoms that we have. One thing stuck with me this week as I prepared this sermon. These people were simple people. While they did extra, extraordinary things, there was nothing extraordinary about them. They were simple people just like you and I, but driven by a love for God, a love for family, and a love for country. These men and women were much like the gentleman who was featured um, on a, a, a story I was watching that just worked and worked, the classic immigrant story. Um, he's a simple guy. He came with nothing in his pockets, and, and we've heard so many of these stories of people who were just blessed by God upon their arrival in this country. These were simple people that put their heads down, valued God, valued family, and valued country. That, that's what this country was built upon. And let me tell you about one of these people, Patrick Henry. Anybody know who that is, Patrick Henry? Patrick Henry was a famous statesman and an orator of colonial Virginia. In 1764, he was elected to the House of Burgesses, where he became a champion of the frontier people, supporting their rights against the arrogant exercise of power by the aristocracy. In 1774, he was a delegate to the First Continental Congress. In 17, 1775, before the Virginia Provincial Convention, which was deeply divided between those who supported England and those who desired freedom, he uttered his most famous words, Give me liberty or give me death. During the Revolutionary War, he became a commander-in-chief of Virginia's military forces, a member of the Second Continental Congress, helped draw up the first constitution of the Commonwealth of Virginia, and was largely responsible for drawing up the amendments to our constitution known as the Bill of Rights. He became Virginia's first governor and was re-elected four times. Then he retired from public life, but despite his strong objections, the people went ahead and re-elected him as governor for the fifth term. But he meant what he said, so he refused to take the office. He was offered a seat in the U.S. Senate. He was offered post as ambassador to Spain or France. President George Washington asked him to join his cabinet and become secretary of state. He later wanted to appoint him chief justice of the Supreme Court, but he refused all such honors and recognitions. And listen to the words from him. It cannot be emphasized too strongly or too often that this great nation was founded not by religionists, but by Christians. Not on religions, but on the gospel of Jesus Christ. His last will and testament was filed in the Brooknell County Courthouse in Virginia. You read his will and you'll see that he left everything to his children, just like most people do. But the last paragraph in his will is especially interesting. He wrote, I have now given everything I own to my children. There is one more thing I wish I could give them, and that is Christ. Because if they have everything I gave them and don't have Christ, they have nothing. Patrick Henry was a simple man who loved first and foremost Jesus. But this simple man loved and served his country, and he loved his family. Back in the 70s, there was a band, a southern rock band called Leonard Skinner. Anyone ever heard of Leonard Skinner? Sweet Home Alabama. Um, that song comes on and every redneck in the world kind of starts bobbing their head and, and jumping around, myself included. Um, but they also recorded a song called Simple Man. Some of you may remember this song. The song is about a mother's advice to her son. And she tells him just to be a simple man. She said he will have all he needs within his soul and that he shouldn't chase after wealth and fame and riches. This is a little ironic because this song helped him do just that. But she advised him to, to remember God in all things that he did. And our scripture today is about being a simple man or a simple woman. About remembering God and doing what is right and showing love and mercy to our fellow man. 
That's what God wanted from his people who had wandered away from him. He tells them that what he requires of his people is very simple. God wants us to be simple men and simple women. Let's read our scripture for today. Give me a Micah 6, 3 through 8. Oh, my people, what have I done to you? What have I done to make you tired of me? Answer me. For I brought you out of Egypt and redeemed you from slavery. I sent Moses, Arian, and Miriam to help you. Don't you remember, my people, how King Balak of Moab tried to have you cursed and how Balaam, son of Beor, blessed you instead? And remember your journey from Achaia Grove to Gilgal when I, the Lord, did everything I could to teach you about my faithfulness faithfulness. Should we offer him thousands of rams and 10,000 rivers of olive oil? Should we sacrifice our firstborn children to pay for our sins? No, O people, the Lord has told you what is good, and this is what he requires of you, to do what is right, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. See, the people of Israel had turned away from God, and this was God's indictment of them. He cries out, what have I done for you to abandon me like you have? Look back at your history and you can see that I have done nothing but bless you as a nation and you have abandoned me. He reminds them of all the things he had done for them. And they ask, and it almost seems patronizing the way that they ask, but they ask how they can get back into a relationship that they once had with God. What can we do to pay for our sins as a nation and as individuals? They, they, they recommend sacrifices all the way up to their firstborn children. But God says, no, I don't want your sacrifices. I just want you to live a life that honors me. Just be simple people. We could substitute America for Israel in our scripture this morning, and it would read something like this. Oh, America, what have I done to you? Why have you tired of me? Why have you abandoned the principles upon which you were founded? Your creeds and governing principles speak of your dependence on me, but your actions do not follow your creeds. Don't you remember when you were birthed and I was with you and how I blessed you? Remember the journey that we've traveled together. Some are trying to bring you back, but they're trying to do this through laws and regulations. Don't you remember that Jesus came to set you free from all these rules and all these regulations? You can't correct your problems and idolatry through legislation. For some reason, we don't get this. In 2022, we don't get this. The failure of America, the crumbling that we see from our original foundation, is because we have been empire builders and not kingdom builders. We have put our hope in men instead of God. And we've done this out of what I think is good intentions. But it hasn't worked out for us. This isn't new. This was the problem with Israel. It was the problem with the Roman Empire. And it's been the problem here. The Puritans came over and it's documented time and time again with the goal of expanding the kingdom of God to the new world. It didn't take us long to get selfish, did it? We have justified sin in the name of survival. America has done so many good things for the world but we've allowed so much sin in the name of prosperity and in the name of survival. The, the biggest of those blemishes is slavery. This is not a new problem. America is where we are right now because we, the church, has cared more about expanding the empire, our empire, than we have the kingdom. No one wants to hear that, but it's true. We've used our freedom poorly and put our hope in men and women who will always let us down. And I think we've done this out of good intentions. You look back at the 70s and the moral majority with Jerry Falwell. I think everyone had good intentions. But what happens? More and more and more, we make those laws, those rules, those institutions, that empire an idol instead of a tool. And men and women will always let us down. I will let my wife down as a husband. I will let my son down as a father. One day I'll let my grandchildren down and I will let you down as a pastor. 
it will happen. God will never let you down. So as a church, if you put your hope in me, we are doomed. Paul tells the Galatian church how to use their freedom. Now, this isn't going to be on the screen, but it's Galatians 5, 13 to 26. You, my brothers and sisters, were called to be free, but do not use your freedom to indulge the flesh. Rather, serve one another humbly in love, for the entire law is fulfilled in keeping this one command. Love your neighbor as yourself. If you bite and devour each other, watch out or you will be destroyed by each other. Does that sound familiar? So I say, walk by the Spirit and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the flesh desires what is contrary to the Spirit and the Spirit what is contrary to the flesh. They are in conflict with each other so that you are not to do whatever you want. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. The acts of the flesh are obvious. And I want us to think about this because I think in the world we're in, is very polarized. We have a camp over here and a camp over here. There doesn't seem to be much unity. There doesn't seem to be much compassion, much of a willingness to listen to each other. So we have a group over here that sees themselves in one way and a group over here that sees themselves in one way, but they both see themselves the same. They look in the mirror and they, they're self-righteous, myself included. One group is more pious, one group is more loving, but we, we both fell miserably at this standard. So pay attention to see what the, the walk by the, the flesh does. The acts of the flesh are obvious. Sexual immorality, impurity, and debauchery. Idolatry and witchcraft. Hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions, and envy. Drunkenness, orgies, and the like. I warn you, as I did before, that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against, the, against such things there is no law. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. Since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking, and envying of each other. And as I read these, there's many of these things in the flesh that I don't do, that the Lord has, I've done, but currently I don't. But there are many that I struggle with. When I get on Facebook, I, I so want to address every idiocy that I see. <laughs> but here's the thing. Many people say the same thing about me, and I know that. That is the temptation to tell people how we are right and they are wrong, right? I don't participate in orgies or sexual immorality, but idolatry I do. Factions, that's hard for me not to go there. Envy, anyone ever been envious? Yep, me too. I need more of the spirit and less of the flesh. This country was founded on Christian values. The fruit of the Spirit is the values we must return to. We can't legislate that, folks. We cannot legislate the fruit of the Spirit. And the church must lead the way. We must lead the way. And here's how you can reconcile yourselves and your country to me, God tells them. Here are the three simple steps to reconciliation both for you and for your nation. Be simple men. Be simple people. Here's how you are to act. Let's look at verse 8 again. O oh, people, the Lord has told you what is good. And this is what he requires of you. To do what is right, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. First he says, do what is right. Many translations, almost all translations that are word for word say to do justice there. Justice involves the sense of a standard of equality among people. It can be as simple as being honest in even the smallest routine business transaction. On over in verse 11, 
in Micah is that the prophet complained about the person who uses dishonest scales with a bag of false weights. There's an old saying that honesty is the best policy, but for the Christian, the slogan should be honesty is the only policy, right? Because this is a consistent theme in all of Scripture, that we are called to be people of fairness and integrity and people who seek justice. In Psalm 51, 6, we read, But you desire honesty from the womb. In Proverbs 4, 23, we read, Guard your heart above all else, for it determines the course of your life. We must settle it deep in our hearts to be people of integrity and be on guard in the battle to do what is right. We must settle it in our heart to be a people that seeks justice for all people. Even at the risk of being called a liberal, I said it, or a social justice warrior. We must settle it in our heart that we are going to seek to do what's right and seek justice. And this has to be our standard. Not our political parties, not any affiliation we have. Micah tells us three things God requires of us. One is to do what is right. And that's easy talk. But it's hard to make a reality. We're a nation of Enrons. And they're not all on a large scale. We do the cheating on small scale sometimes. That never make the headlines. Some of us cheat our neighbors. Some of us cheat our government. Out of what is due to them in taxes. I understand that temptation. If some can find a way to swindle an employee or steal from our employer, we will do it. But God requires all of us, Enron or each simple individual, to do what is right, to do what is just. To be a simple man or woman, do what is right, seek justice. Next, God says to love mercy. A businessman needed to have a professional photo taken. When the photographer, photographer was done, the man looked at his photo and complained, this doesn't do me justice. The photographer responded, with a face like yours, you don't need justice, you need mercy. Um, we all need mercy, right? We all need it. We all need to offer it. We are compelled by Christ to offer unconditional acceptance of others in spite of their faults, their idiosyncrasies, their sins, and their shortcomings. We have all received so much grace and so much mercy from our Lord. All of you have done many things to deserve the wrath of God. But Christ has shown you mercy. Not because you are good, but because he is good. If we are to follow Jesus, we must be people that actively look for ways to show mercy to those who need it most. The story is told of a young man named John Gilbert who lived in a California town called Paradise. When he was five years old, John was diagnosed with muscular dystrophy. He was told it would eventually destroy every muscle and finally, in a space of 10 or years or so, take his life. John Gilbert passed away a few years ago at the age of 25. While alive, John experienced a lot of exclusion and a lot of cruelty from his peers growing up. But at one point, he was named the representative for everyone with his condition in the state of California. He was flown to Sacramento and was ushered with his mother into the governor's office for a private meeting. That night, the NFL, the National Football League, sponsored a fundraising auction and dinner at which Don John was a guest. The players let him hold their huge Super Bowl rings, which almost extended to his wrist. When the auction began, one particular item caught John's attention. It was a basketball signed by the players of the Sacramento Kings. John got a little carried away because when the ball was up for bid, he raised his hand. As soon as his hand went up, John's mother pulled it down. John's words were, astronauts never felt as many G's as my wrist when my mother yanked it down. The bidding for the basketball rose to an astounding amount for an item that was not the most valuable item on the docket. Eventually, one man named a figure that shocked the room and then no one else could match. The man went to the front and collected his prize. 
But instead of returning to his seat, the man walked across the room and placed it in the thin, small hands of the boy who admired it so intently. The man placed the, the ball in the hands of a boy who would never dribble it down a court, never throw it to a teammate on a fast break, never fire it from three-point range, but those hands would cherish it. Have you, brought, have you bought a basketball for anyone lately? To love mercy is to love others with God's heart. And to love others, that's a nice way of saying love everybody with the heart of God. Being a simple man or a simple woman means to show God's mercy. We do this by sharing his grace, not by his judgment. We do this by sharing his forgiveness, not blame. We do this by sharing his patience, not irritations. We do this by sharing his kindness, not our harshness. Lastly, Micah writes that we are to walk humbly with God. Basically, this means to accept God as who he is. Your king, your savior, your creator, your redeemer. You realize who is in control and humble yourself before him. That means that we acknowledge that he is God and we are not. That this is his universe, therefore he gets to make the rules. And when I get my own universe, I can make the rules. Simply love God. Give him the prominence in his life that he deserves. And that's simple. These are simple things that we can do. And these are things that we have lost. Spend 10 minutes on Facebook or I say Facebook because I'm getting older. I know like none of the kids use Facebook. That's for old people. Um, but even like some clergy groups, some pastor groups, it takes two minutes for people to be at each other. And it's even worse amongst like normal people. You see it on Lake Area Happenings. It happens all the time. We go from one to ten like that. Someone becomes our enemy because of one sentence. And as I was finishing this sermon, God impressed it upon me that these three things he wants from us as individuals and as a nation are basically the two commands that, of Jesus that we are to follow. And I'm closing. When we do what is right and show mercy, this is the relationship that God wants us to have with our fellow man. When we seek justice and we give mercy, that is to love our neighbor. To walk humbly with God is the relationship that he wants to have with us. It all goes back to his two commands. Love God love each other. Folks, if we are to turn the country back to God, it will not start in the legislature. It will not, it'll start in the, in the hearts of individuals following these simple commands. Be simple, love God, love your family, love each other. And here's the thing. If we believe that this country can be all that God wants it to be, that it can honor the Lord. It doesn't start in D.C. It doesn't start in Jeff City. It starts here, right? It starts in my house. It starts with the way I love my wife, the way I sacrificially serve you, serve my wife, serve the church, how we serve each other. With a group of men and women who are committed to doing what is right and seeking justice who love mercy and walk humbly with the Lord, to live and act in the fruit of the Spirit. We need Him. We need the Holy Spirit. We need to stop trying to do things for God and start doing things with Him, empowered by Him. We need the Spirit. We need as a country to be desperate for a move of the Holy Spirit. We need to depend on him to pray. In our Wednesday night Bible study, someone mentioned we just need to pray for revival. Pray together. And I am sweating. We need to be on our knees praying for a revival of his church in his country. And we don't know what that's going to look like. It may not ever look like the America of old but it's going to look like a country that is under his sovereign hand. But we need his spirit. 
We need to repent and turn to him as a nation. But that starts with you. It starts with you men. It starts with you women. It starts with you teenagers. So as we sing this final song, and we think about just God's providence, his sovereignty in this country, the freedom that we have, the question I'm going to ask you is, how are we going to use that freedom moving forward? Are we going to act in the flesh? Or are we going to walk in the spirit? Father, thank you, Lord. Thank you for the opportunity to repent, to turn away from us, and to turn towards you, Lord. We need you. Holy Spirit, we need you in this place. And Father, we pray for revival of this church, Lord, revival of our souls, revival in the lake community, Lord. That men and women turn from themselves and towards you, Lord. We pray that churches are planted, that marriages are healed, that men, addictions are broken, Lord, that the lost become saved, that the blind might see, and that you might be glorified, Lord. Would you have your way in here this morning, Holy Spirit? In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. So as you leave here, I just want to leave three things with you. Search for an opportunity in your day, and we get busy, and we're going to leave here, and we're going to do what we do the 4th of July, have a great time, eat hot dogs with mustard, uh, do whatever you're going to do, but... <laughs> All right. Um, let's, uh, let's look for an opportunity to seek justice every day, to show mercy to someone in our lives, and to walk humbly with the Lord. Those are three things we can all do. Just look for that opportunity daily. Ask the Lord to show you, and He is faithful. Father, Lord, thank you for your mercy. Lord, thank you for your blessings. And as we go and we celebrate our freedom, our independence, Lord, let us not forget the true freedom, Lord comes in Jesus Christ. Let us act mercifully, Lord, to seek justice, Lord, and to walk humbly before you in everything that we do. Help us to love each other, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. You are dismissed.